Chapter Nine of At the Earth's Core. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Nine: The Face of Death. I must have fallen asleep from exhaustion. When I awoke I was very hungry, and after busying myself searching for fruit for a while I set off through the jungle to find the beach. I knew that the island was not so large, but that I could easily find the sea if I did but move in a straight line, but there came the difficulty, as there was no way in which I could direct my course and hold it, the sun, of course, being always directly above my head, and the trees so thickly set that I could see no distant object which might serve to guide me in a straight line. As it was, I must have walked for a great distance, since I ate four times and slept twice before I reached the sea. But at last I did so, and my pleasure at the sight of it was greatly enhanced by the chance discovery of a hidden canoe among the bushes, through which I had stumbled just prior to coming upon the beach. I can tell you that it did not take me long to pull that awkward craft down to the water and shove it far out from shore. My experience with Jaw had taught me that if I were to steal another canoe I must be quick about it, and get far beyond the owner's reach as soon as possible. I must have come out upon the opposite side of the island from that at which Jaw and I had entered it, for the mainland was nowhere in sight. For a long time I paddled around the shore, though well out, before I saw the mainland in the distance. At the sight of it I lost no time in directing my course toward it, for I had long since made up my mind to return to Futra and give myself up, that I might be once more with Perry and Gak the hairy one. I felt that I was a fool ever to have attempted to escape alone, especially in view of the fact that our plans were already well formulated to make a break for freedom together. Of course I realized that the chances of the success of our proposed venture were slim indeed, but I knew that I never could enjoy freedom without Perry, so long as the old man lived, and I had learned that the probability that I might find him was less than slight. Had Perry been dead, I should gladly have pitted my strength and wit against the savage and primordial world in which I found myself. I could have lived in seclusion within some rocky cave until I had found the means to outfit myself with the crude weapons of the Stone Age and then set out in search of her whose image had now become the constant companion of my waking hours, and the central and beloved figure of my dreams. But to the best of my knowledge Perry still lived, and it was my duty and wish to be again with him, that we might share the dangers and vicissitudes of this strange world we had discovered. And Gak, too. The great shaggy man had found a place in the hearts of us both, for he was indeed every inch a man and king, uncouth perhaps, and brutal too, if judged too harshly by the standards of effete twentieth-century civilization, but withal noble, dignified, chivalrous, and lovable. Chance carried me to the very beach upon which I had discovered Jaws' canoe, and a short time later I was scrambling up the steep bank to retrace my steps from the plain of Futra. But my troubles came when I entered the canyon beyond the summit, for here I found that several of them centered at the point where I crossed the divide, and which one I had traversed to reach the pass I could not for the life of me remember. It was all a matter of chance, and so I set off down that which seemed the easiest going, and in this I made the same mistake that many of us do in selecting the path along which we shall follow out the course of our lives, and again learned that it is not always best to follow the line of least resistance. By the time I had eaten eight meals, and slept twice, I was convinced that I was upon the wrong trail, for between Futra and the inland sea I had not slept at all, and had eaten but once. To retrace my steps to the summit of the divide and explore another canyon seemed the only solution of my problem, but a sudden widening and levelness of the canyon, just before me, seemed to suggest that it was about to open into a level country and with the lure of discovery strong upon me, I decided to proceed but a short distance farther before I turned back. The next turn of the canyon brought me to its mouth, and before me I saw a narrow plain leading down to an ocean. At my right the side of the canyon continued to the water's edge, 
the valley lying to my left, and the foot of it running gradually into the sea where it formed a broad, level beach. Clumps of strange trees dotted the landscape, here and there, almost to the water, and rank grass and ferns grew between. From the nature of the vegetation I was convinced that the land between the ocean and the foothills was swampy, though directly before me it seemed dry enough all the way to the sandy strip along which the restless waters advanced and retreated. Curiosity prompted me to walk down to the beach, for the scene was very beautiful. As I passed along beside the deep and tangled vegetation of the swamp, I thought that I saw a movement of the ferns at my left. But though I stopped a moment to look, it was not repeated, and if anything lay hid there, my eyes could not penetrate the dense foliage to discern it. Presently I stood upon the beach, looking out over that wide and lonely sea across whose forbidding bosom no human being had yet ventured, to discover what strange and mysterious lands lay beyond, or what its invisible islands held of riches, wonders, or adventure. What savage faces, what fierce and formidable beasts were this very instant watching the lapping of the waves upon its farther shore? How far did it extend? Perry had told me that the seas of Pellucidar were small in comparison with those of the outer crust, but even so this great ocean might stretch its broad expanse for thousands of miles. For countless ages it had rolled up and down its countless miles of shore, and yet today it remained all unknown beyond the tiny strip that was visible from its beaches. The fascination of speculation was strong upon me. It was as though I had been carried back to the birth time of our own outer world, to look upon its lands and seas, ages before man had traversed either. Here was a new world, all untouched. It called to me to explore it. I was dreaming of the excitement and adventure which lay before us could Perry and I but escape the Mayhars, when something, a slight noise, I imagine, drew my attention behind me. As I turned, romance, adventure, and discovery, in the abstract, took wing before the terrible embodiment of all three in concrete form that I beheld advancing upon me. A huge, slimy amphibian it was, with a toad-like body and the mighty jaws of an alligator. Its immense carcass must have weighed tons, and yet it moved swiftly and silently toward me. Upon one hand was the bluff that ran from the canyon to the sea, on the other the fearsome swamp from which the creature had sneaked upon me. Behind lay the mighty untracked sea, and before me in the center of the narrow way that led to safety stood this huge mountain of terrible and menacing flesh. A single glance at the thing was sufficient to assure me that I was facing one of those long-extinct prehistoric creatures whose fossilized remains are found within the outer crust as far back as the Triassic formation, a gigantic labyrinthodon. And there I was, unarmed and with the exception of a loincloth as naked as I had come into the world. I could imagine how my first ancestor felt that distant prehistoric morn that he encountered for the first time the terrifying progenitor of the thing that had me cornered now beside the restless mysterious sea. Unquestionably he had survived, or I should not have been within Pellucidar or elsewhere, and I wished at that moment that he had handed down to me with the various attributes that I presumed I have inherited from him, the specific application of the instinct of self-preservation which saved him from the fate which loomed so close before me today. To seek escape in the swamp or in the ocean would have been similar to jumping into a den of lions who escape one upon the outside. The sea and swamp both were doubtless alive with these mighty carnivorous amphibians, and if not the individual that menaced me would pursue me into either the sea or swamp with equal facility. There seemed nothing to do but stand supinely and await my end. I thought of Perry, how he would wonder what had become of me. I thought of my friends of the outer world, and of how they all would go on living their lives in total ignorance of the strange and terrible fate that had overtaken me, or unguessing the weird surroundings which had witnessed the last frightful agony of my extinction. And with these thoughts came a realization of how unimportant to the life and happiness of the world is the existence of any one of us we may be snuffed out without an instant's warning, 
and for a brief day our friends speak of us with subdued voices. The following morning, while the first worm is busily engaged in testing the construction of our coffin, they are teeing up for the first hole to suffer more acute sorrow over a sliced ball than they did over our, to us, untimely demise. The labyrinthodon was coming more slowly now. He seemed to realize that escape for me was impossible, and I could have sworn that his huge fanged jaws grinned in pleasurable appreciation of my predicament, or was it in anticipation of the juicy morsel which would so soon be pulp between those formidable teeth? He was about fifty feet from me when I heard a voice calling to me from the direction of the bluff at my left. I looked and could have shouted in delight at the sight that met my eyes, for there stood Jaw, waving frantically to me, and urging me to run for it to the cliff's base. I had no idea that I should escape the monster that had marked me for his breakfast, but at least I should not die alone. Human eyes would watch me end. It was cold comfort, I presume, but yet I derived some slight peace of mind from the contemplation of it. To run seemed ridiculous, especially toward that steep and unscalable cliff, and yet I did so, and as I ran I saw Ja, agile as a monkey, crawl down the precipitous face of the rocks, clinging to small projections, and the tough creepers that had found root-hold here and there. The labyrinthodon evidently thought that Ja was coming to double his portion of human flesh, so he was in no haste to pursue me to the cliff and frighten away this other tidbit. Instead he merely trotted along behind me. As I approached the foot of the cliff I saw what Ja intended doing, but I doubted if the thing would prove successful. He had come down to within twenty feet of the bottom, and there clinging with one hand to a small ledge, and with his feet resting precariously upon tiny bushes that grew from the solid face of the rock, he lowered the point of his long spear until it hung some six feet above the ground. To clamber up that slim shaft without dragging jaw down and precipitating both to the same doom from which the copper-colored one was attempting to save me seemed utterly impossible and as I came near the spear I told Ja so, and that I could not risk him to try to save myself. But he insisted that he knew what he was doing, and was in no danger himself. The danger is still yours, he called, for unless you move much more rapidly than you are now, the Scythic will be upon you, and drag you back before ever you are halfway up the spear. He can rear up and reach you with ease anywhere below where I stand. Well, Ja should know his own business, I thought and so I grasped the spear and clambered up toward the red man as rapidly as I could, being so far removed from my simian ancestors as I am. I imagine the slow-witted Scythic, as Ja called him, suddenly realized our intentions and that he was quite likely to lose all his meal instead of having it doubled as he had hoped. When he saw me clambering up that spear he let out a hiss that fairly shook the ground, and came charging after me at a terrific rate. I had reached the top of the spear by this time, or almost. Another six inches would give me a hold on Jaw's hand, when I felt a sudden wrench from below, and glancing fearfully down saw the mighty jaws of the monster close on the sharp point of the weapon. I made a frantic effort to reach Jaw's hand. The Scythic gave a tremendous tug that came near to jerking Jaw from his frail hold on the surface of the rock. The spear slipped from his fingers, and still clinging to it I plunged feet foremost toward my executioner. At the instant that he felt the spear come away from Jaw's hand, the creature must have opened his huge jaws to catch me, for when I came down, still clinging to the butt-end of the weapon, the point yet rested in his mouth, and the result was that the sharpened end transfixed his lower jaw. With the pain he snapped his mouth closed. I fell upon his snout, lost my hold upon the spear, rolled the length of his face and head across his short neck onto his broad back, and from there to the ground. Scarce had I touched the earth than I was upon my feet, dashing madly for the path by which I had entered this horrible valley. A glance over my shoulder showed me the Scythic engaged and pawing at the spear stuck through his lower jaw, and so busily engaged did he remain in this occupation that I had gained the safety of the cliff-top before he was ready to take up the pursuit. When he did not discover me in sight within the valley, he dashed, hissing, into the rank vegetation of the swamp, and that was the last I saw of him. End of chapter 9